Will you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24? Matthew, chapter 24. Tonight, the, the subject and the topic is an overview of prophecy given from the Mount of Olives. An overview of prophecy given from the Mount of Olives. I'm very aware that Matthew 24 is a very, very contentious chapter in the Word of God. Different schools of thought around eschatology, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, would be things like preterism and historicism and futurism. And if you don't know about that, then you're blessed. (laughs) Because it can be a minefield. I believe there's actually a lot of, uh, or bits of some of it here that we must look at tonight. And I hope tonight that you'll receive a blessing. But above all, we know that the Lord Jesus is coming back again. We want to show you some of the things tonight that people um, may disagree with me on, but that's fine. That's okay. You're allowed to be wrong if you want. And, <laughs> uh, and we can just carry on. I- I'm jesting. Uh, we're going to read the first three verses of Matthew 24, but listen, we're going to read a lot of Scripture, and we're going to refer to a lot of things. There will be some teaching. I don't know. Sometimes I preach, sometimes I teach, and we'll see how the Lord leads us tonight. Matthew 24 and verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Let's pray. Father, take your word and help me to break the bread of life to your people, but help us all, Lord, to see your your son is soon coming, the soon coming king to take up his rightful place and to rule and reign. Father, we ask you that you would help us, Lord, with open hearts and minds to be able to take within us the engrafted word of God. We ask you, Father, that you would, Lord, take away all our, our things that we have heard, Lord, that have maybe indoctrinated us, Lord, and even given us false ideas of the coming of Christ. But rather, that you'd put truth within us and cause us to be alive for you, ready and waiting, watching, praying for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Oh, Father, I ask you to help me. I'm just a man of flesh. And I ask you, Lord, for your anointing upon your word tonight. For it's not by might nor by power. By thy spirit, saith the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. When the Lord Jesus here, we're told in verse 1, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Verse 1 tells us that Jesus is walking out of the temple. I believe from the previous chapter, chapter 23, now you're going into chapter 24. Remember, there's no chapter and verse in the original manuscripts, but they're there, a place for our help and our reading and understanding. And I believe coming from chapter 23 into chapter 24, that this is very important because Jesus in the beginning of chapter 24 has turned his back on the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and is now walking out. And the idea is not he's just walking out and I'll see you later, guys. I'll come back at another day. The idea of Jesus walking out and leaving the temple was that he was walking away as one who did never mean to come back again to that temple. He would never come back to the temple in Jerusalem. Now notice this, he goes from there to the Mount of Olives and privately that's where he divulges his heart. You see, brother and sister, if you really want to know what the heart of God is for you, for your family, for your life, take, your, take the Bible, take the book, take the scriptures and go to the private place and start to seek him and he'll show you the things of God. Notice in chapter 23, we must look at it to really understand, I want you to get the background I want you to get the backdrop. I want you to get the mindset of Christ on this. For this is so important for why some of the things I believe, why he said it, and why they're taking place, and why they have taken place. 
For example, in chapter 23, there are the eight woes of Christ to the Pharisees and the scribes. These eight woes are woes of judgment upon these Pharisees. The Pharisees and the scribes were the legal uh, scribes of, the, of Jewry, J-E-W-R-Y, and they were also the, the legal, not only the legal, but the religious side being the Pharisees, the leaders of, if you want, if I can call it the Jewish church at that time. The preoccupied mind of Christ was against them because of their hypocritical leadership. And they were nothing short. Now listen, this is, I'm going to prove this to you. They were nothing short that the emissaries of the devil who had robed themselves in self-righteousness. They were emissaries of the wicked one who had robed themselves in self-righteousness. The eight woes of Christ in chapter 23 or as such, chapter 23, jot them down from verses 13 to 16 in every verse it is said. Then from verse 23, it's in verse 25, verse 27, and in verse 29. I haven't time to read through chapter 23 with you, but if you can read that when you go home and then go into chapter 24, you'll understand why Jesus is leaving the temple with the mindset to never return to it. Calvary was ahead of him now never to return to it. For example, in uh, chapter 23 and verse 13, it says, he says, but woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, he calls them. Notice that. Notice what he says in the chapter. They're shutting up the kingdom of heaven against men, and they're not entering in themselves. That, that, that sort of mindset and that spirit is still alive very much today in our society. Well, there are men who are dressed up in self-righteousness and they're saying that we are the elite and they're saying we are this, that, and the other where God is concerned and they're leading multitude millions to hell. They're not entering themselves and none others will enter in because they're not trusting in what Christ has done for them. He says in verse 13 that they're shutting up the kingdom of heaven against men. Verse 14, who, these Pharisees, will receive the greater damnation. Notice, and are making notice the proselyte, a twofold more child of hell than yourselves, he says in verse 15. He says, you're going as far as you can to get a conversion of someone. And he says, you're making them a twofold more child of hell than you are yourself. Bringing, damning, men and women to a lost eternity. So notice what he says. He calls them in verse 16, blind guides. And Jesus says, if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. He calls them blind guides who will have it all wrong. They swear, bringing oaths into the temple, yet reject the living God whom they say they worship, standing before them in the person of his son. You're going to slay thousands of lambs this week of Passover, and the Lamb of God is right before you. That's what he's saying. The Lamb of God is right before you. Now, notice this. He also says to them in verse 23, they omitted the weightier matters of the law, of judgment and faith, mercy. I believe he's rehearsing Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 there. What doth the Lord require of thee? And these things are all stipulated in Micah. And the Lord, knowing the word of God, being the word of God made flesh, here he's speaking to these men saying, I'm the one the prophet spoke of. And you're omitting not that, he says, they're lesser, the tithes, the mint, and all those sort of stuff. He says, all those things you do in church, as it were, in temple, that's okay. He says, but the weightier measures your hearts are not right because... He says, you're more interested in the peripheral things and the things of work of the church, but you forgot the God of the work. You've rejected him in him. Verse 27, he declares, notice Jesus says of these Pharisees and scribes, he says, they're like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Now we're getting a picture here. Can you imagine the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ here? Can you imagine his, his uh, spirit here is angry at these men? And he's saying, you're like white as sepulchers. What they used to do was paint the, the graves and the tombs of around Jerusalem white. 
And it was for a couple of reasons it cleaned up and made it look it made it look more glorious in the time of Passover. But another reason was in the darkness of night, if anyone was going for the Passover and touched anything to do with the dead, they couldn't take of the Passover. That's how much their laws had laid hold on them. And he said, you're like that. Oh, you're like, here I am, the white of sepulcher. But inside you, he says, you're like dead men's bones. Within you, you're dead. And full of all uncleanness. Verse 29, if you look at chapter 23, verse 29, he says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Notice what he calls in verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell, he says. Jesus said that. Are you getting his mindset now? He says, you're a generation of vipers. In fact, David Guzik in his uh, commentary, he says uh, what Jesus is saying, you are the family of the devil. You are the family of the devil. How can you escape the damnation of hell. Now look at verse 37, please. He mentions, if you read on there, he mentions that in a parable st style, look, I have sent the prophets. Who sent the prophets? He tells us in the other gospels and earlier in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, tells us of the, the man who has the, the vineyard and he goes into a far place and he sends forth servants to take the fruit of the vineyard. That's the prophets of the Old Testament. And he says that they beat them, they stone them, they kill them and cast them out. But he says, they'll reverence my son when I send him, speaking of himself coming. But they beat him and entreat him spitefully and they kill him. Come, let us kill the air, they say. Jesus speaking of himself that men would kill him. He says later in chapter 23, read on from where it was, and he says about the prophets being sent. He says, I sent. Who is he then? Jesus is claiming to be the almighty God of the Old Testament. He is saying that I am Yahweh. I am God, the mighty God in flesh. I sent those prophets, yet I am the son who has come to bleed and die on the cross. So notice this, verse 37, he cries, and this time the cry is not in judgment, but it's for the people. He cries with a heart of pathos and sadness. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not behold your house is left unto you desolate. Notice, behold your house, or it means behold your temple. Now get the mindset. He says, your temple is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jesus is now walking away from the temple in chapter 24, verse 1, with the mindset, your temple is left unto you desolate. You're off your father, the devil. You're off the family of the devil. He says, I want nothing more to do with you. You've stoned the prophets. You've killed them. Now the son has come. You're slaying lambs. He says, but the lamb of God is here. You've rejected me. I reject you. How do you know he rejects them? If you were to go to Matthew chapter 21, one simple verse, verse 43. Listen to what the Lord Jesus says to them again. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. He's saying this to the Jews, the Jewish leaders. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now let's just stop for a moment. He says, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation. Now people say that's the church. It's not the church, brothers and sisters. If that's the church, then you're speaking of replacement theology, which is not the church. 
The word missioner is not ecclesia for the church. If he said ecclesia, then there would be a place to say, well then, he's given it to, he's taken it off the Jews and given everything onto the church. That's not what he's saying here. The word here is not ecclesia, but ethnos. It's where you and I get the word ethnic from. In other words, there's other brethren, and they will bring forth the fruits thereof. Who's the other brethren? Simple. 150 years ago, the house of Israel were scattered. That's the other brethren. That's the other nation. That's the other sheep of this fold of I yet to gather in. That's the ones Christ is speaking of. And so we have the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24. And verse 1, walking out of the temple. And the disciples have decided to tell him, look, there must have been some sort of mood. Now you and I find that hard to believe. But Jesus, he made whips and he whipped them out of the temple at one time. You know, gentle Jesus making in mind to have the little hands and some of the, the, little, the little paintings and the photographs. And he's like this here. And he's very effeminate. You know, that wasn't the Jesus, that, the real Jesus. That's an idol. It wasn't the real Jesus. We don't know what the real Jesus looked like, but this is what we know. He was a man. He was a man's man. And here he is now, and he's saying, I'm not coming back again to you. This temple's finished. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He's walking away. There's some sort of mood set, mindset of him, and the disciples are starting to turn him to the temple because the Jews worshipped the temple, you see. The, door, the temple had gold, golden doors, and the, uh, it shone from the hillside. It was said you could see it for miles whenever the temple was in its full glory. When the sun shone on it, it was like a city on a hill that could not be hid. There's a pale imitation sitting where the temple sat now as a golden dome instead, isn't there? Trying to replicate that which God had done. But notice this. Notice this. They turn Jesus to the temple as if this is going to bring him out of this judgment mindset. I have something to tell you, friend, if you're not saved. Something that Jesus set his mind on this and he didn't turn back. And it's the same for a man and woman who aren't saved. His mind doesn't change. If you stand before him in that day and you've rejected Christ all your days, when you stand before him, he doesn't say, ah, well, sure, we'll just like to slip in on in. We'll just let you go on with it. Sure, you weren't bad. Listen, all of us were sinners. Listen. Listen to what God's word says. John chapter 3 and verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. It doesn't say he that believeth on the old temple. It doesn't even say he that believeth on the next temple. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say if you're a Jew and you'll get saved in the, in the rebuilt temple that they're trying to rebuild. It doesn't say that. It says, Whosoever believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. You see, the one, those who aren't saved, God's wrath is abiding on you. You don't even know it, but the wrath of God is abiding on you. That means it lives, it hovers, it waits, it's there. The wrath of God abides on him and her who do not Christ. Gives the idea that this wrath not just abides but it's something that you cannot expect to go away with the passing of time. Even things from years ago, we may tend to forget them. It's just like it's happened this moment in his eyes. The mindset of God is sure and as definite as Jesus was with the temple. He says, He that believeth on the Son shall not see life. Sh Pardon me. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. There was a, the old preacher George Whitfield, I'm told that he would have been preaching it many of times and he would have been preaching with the tears streaming down his face. And he had lifted his hands up a lot when he was preaching. And he used to preach and cry, Oh, the wrath to come! Oh, the wrath to come! Oh, the wrath to come! With such pathos and passion that he used to have to stop and compose himself because of the emotion within him for those who were under the wrath, the abiding wrath of God. He couldn't contain it. 
Here, Jesus said, your house was left unto you desolate, and that abiding wrath was continuous. And in AD 70, their temple, temple was destroyed when the Romans came to sack Jerusalem. Now, notice this. The disciples ask him, ask him three questions in verse 3. First one is, when shall these things be? Secondly, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world will be the third one. So what shall be the sign of thy coming? And what is that, as it were, or what shall be the end of the world? See, in verse 2, as they're showing Jesus the temple, he looks upon it. It was massive structure. Absolutely massive building. And as he looks upon it, he says, see this temple. He says, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now here's something. You see the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem? That's not that temple. That's a retaining wall. That isn't even the temple. If it is, Jesus got it wrong. But he never gets it wrong. That's a retaining wall. That's not the temple. Notice here. Notice this. He's on the Mount of Olives, and he starts to give this Olivet this course. But he starts from where he is to where he will come back to. Isn't that amazing? It's like Moses, Yahweh says to Moses, Moses, you're going into Egypt. You're going to get the children of Israel. What do you do with them? He says, I'll meet you back here. <laughs> I'll be here. You're coming back to this place. Jesus sitting on the Mount of Olives says, I'm coming back here. So, Lord, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And what shall be the end of the world? The idea here is it's a, it gives the idea of a successive period of time. In other words, what is the end of the age? Can you tell us, Lord? Now, this is the minefield, okay? In AD 70, we see from verse 15 to 22, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now listen, there are those from what's known as futurist perspective who throw it away into the distance and say, One man Antichrist will make a covenant with the Jews and it'll be broken, and, and this is the abomination of desolation will be there. This isn't it. You know why? Because when we read verse 16, he says, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither in the Sabbath day. Notice what Jesus is saying here. This is a, he's talking about this time in the second coming of Christ. He's saying, look, when I come back again, what does it matter if you're going to be in Judea? He says, the whole world's going to see me. If that's what it is, the whole world is going to see him. What is it going to matter if you've got a coat with you or not? Let's be honest. So the preterist says that everything is fulfilled in 87. I don't believe it was. There are things that were fulfilled, and this is one of them. See how it's a minefield? I can go and get myself into trouble now. Now notice. Notice. Verse 21. For then. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sakes, those days shall be shortened. Jesus says, then in those days, what is those days? When Titus, the Roman prince, comes to tear the temple of, in Jerusalem down, stone by stone and brick by brick. You know what happened now? It is argumented, was it the Jews that went in and fought on from the temple and set fire to the temple themselves? Some said it was the Romans went in. Nevertheless, the temple had been set fire to. And all the gold ran down between those massive stones. And Titus, the son of uh, the Caesar Vespasian, he was the, the main soldier going in to, to lead the armies. He ordered the temple torn down brick by brick to get the gold that was run between the very bricks. Just as Jesus said 40 years later, that's what happened. 
And those who heard the word of God and believed it, and those who heard the word of God and did it, guess what? When the soldiers started coming, because they encamped around Jerusalem, they ran to the hills and they were saved. (laughs) Just as Jesus said. Just like Jesus said. Now notice, again, then after that we had the the destruction of the temple. We had the Jewish diaspora, which is the scattering of the Jews. And after that Jewish diaspora, we then have something else that happens here. Look, in verse 23 to verse 27. (coughs) Excuse me, let me get a drink for a moment. He says, If any man... If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chamber. Believe it not. Who's Jesus speaking about? Why would he speak of the desert? And why would he speak of a secret chamber? Of false Christ. In other words, antichrist. Why would, he, why would he speak like that? Simple. He's looking through time. After the Jewish diaspora. Notice what it says. In those days in verse 22. <clears throat> or pardon me, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation was. Jerusalem was encompassed with the Roman army. There was one million, they say, Jews were crucified or murdered or slain. They had never seen anything like that before. The rest were taken away and scattered and captive. In fact, if you go to Rome today, there's a big arch. And it's called the Arch of Titus, who was the prince. And it's still there to this day with the carvings in it about this happening in Jerusalem. By Notice this. Jesus now brings us ahead of time again. And he says, there's someone who will be an anti-Christ, a false Christ or a false prophet. Notice a false Christ, a false prophet. One will be in the desert. In 622 AD, Muhammad was in the desert. And through lying visions from the bottomless pit, he took on and he formulated what was known as Islam. In the desert. 622. When you hear of the Roman Catholic Church and the popes, and they're now voting on a new pope, then what what happens? They go into a secret chamber, and they sit, and they vote, they wait, and they vote. You know how you know the new pope has been elected? Smoke is sent up from the chamber. Jesus gets it right every time. Jesus gets it right every single time. He says, now if they come, there's a prophet. False prophet. Allah is God and Muhammad is his prophet. It's a false prophet. He says there'll be an antichrist. It's an antichrist spirit right through it. Now I notice this. He says in verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know what he's saying to those who love him and believe him? You're not going to miss me. Don't get carried away by kissing ruby slippers in the Vatican. He says, don't get carried away by going, he says, and becoming so extreme you're cutting people's throats. He says, listen. He says, you don't allow other people to drag you away from the things that are true from the cross. He says, because when you say you're looking for me, he says, you won't miss me. A believer will not miss Christ. You know why? Because he has you. You don't have him. Because he has you, or you don't have him. Notice here, so verse 29 to verse 31 is the second coming then on down. Notice verse 29 immediately. After the tribulation of those days. There's another quagmire for you. After the tribulation. After the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened 
And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heavens be shaken. Now, if this is before tribulation, this says it's after tribulation. But even at that, it can't be secret in any way because it says there's going to be all sorts of things happening. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, the graves are going to be open. There's going to be a war cry in the heavens. How are you going to miss it? There's going to be a war cry in the heavens. The skies are going to be full of his glory. He says, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, you'll see me coming. He says, and when you see me coming, you'll hear me coming. He says, you'll see the dead and Christ rising first. We're going to see it. Brothers and sisters, I have something to say. As much as I believe in the coming of the Lord, and I do with all my heart, I don't believe it's secret. The only thing secret is the day and the hour. He's coming, and his glory is going to be known, and we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Notice what he says. And then shall appear the sign. All those things are happening. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Notice, and he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they shall gather together who? His elect. Now listen, if this is before the tribulation, it says after the tribulation he's coming to gather his elect. Isn't that what the Scripture says? Just throwing that out there. See, what's a quagmire. <laughs> you see? From the four winds from one end of heaven to another. So here he speaks of his second coming. And then he gives us signposts to look for. Verse 32 is one of the most well-known signposts. Verse 32 is the parable of the fig tree. Now I learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. You know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, though that it is near, even at the doors, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we don't know when he's coming, but we know he's coming. Our argument is how he comes, but nevertheless, if you're saved, he's coming for you. <laughs> he's coming again. Notice what he says here, but the parable of the fig tree. The figs and vines and olives are symbols of ancient Israel. The vine became known more for the northern kingdom of Israel, and the fig was for the southern kingdom of Judah, Benjamin and Levi, with Jerusalem and their kings. And the figs then became known as good figs and bad figs in the book of Daniel. Good figs that could be eaten and bad figs that were just so bad they couldn't be eaten. And so th th there became an admixture there of, of proselytization from Babylon. And, and then coming out of Ezra, they, they told him, start to get the bad figs out. We want good figs. And Christ came from that line. Now notice the good fig line. Now listen, so the fig tree becomes a symbol of Judah or, the, or Jewry, J-E-W-R-Y, Jewry. And Jesus says, the fig tree, when you see the fig tree, now he's looking at the temple from the Mount of Olives. The fig tree is all around him. The Jewish, Jewish people are all there. He sees it all, so it's not as if they were gone. They're there. So he's saying, this is going to happen A.D. 70. Here's some of your history. He says, but this will come back again. The impossibility of this happening. He says, you'll have figs back in here again. There'll be a tree start to sprout. I don't want to get too much in this. I'll do it another night. But in Leviticus chapter 26, the Lord says to Israel, that if you come against me and you disobey me, I will punish you. I'm paraphrasing for time's sake. Seven times more for your sins. Seven times punishment that becomes known as seven times, one time is 360, a circle 360 degrees. So one time is 360. Three, 360 multiplied by seven is 2,520. 
a day for a year in prophecy. A day for a year means 2,520 years. Now, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so just bear with me. 645 to 641, because the numbers go down when you're coming from B.C. to north. The Judah, house of Judah was being attacked. The house of Israel are gone. House of Judah are being attacked. And when you take the time from their punishment of their attack, um, 645 B.C., and you bring that 2,520 years right down, start taking it off the number, right down to the year minus one. There's no naught, so you add one for the year plus one AD. And you keep going on, it brings you to the year 1917 AD, just over 100 years ago. And on the, on, in 1917, uh, a man called uh, General, Be- General Beauvoir comes to a, a, a captain at the time, I think he was a captain at the time, uh, and he became a general later, later on called Lord Balfour. Or pardon me, not Balfour. Uh, Allenby, General Allenby. And he comes and he says, I want you to go, and I want you to take Jerusalem from the Ottoman Turks, the Gentile powers. Uh, Jesus says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And the Turks were there at that time. And so uh, they have this talk, and and uh, Allenby didn't want to go because no one was able to prize the Turks out of Jerusalem. And so what happens is he, uh, Belvoir takes the book of uh, Henry Grattan Guinness, who was a famous evangelist and preacher and Bible teacher in the States. He's from Dublin. He's part of the Guinness family in Dublin. And he had done this in 1888. The Light for the Last Days was the book. And he says, look at the Bible prophecy. And according to this, the seven times punishment of the southern kingdom of Judah is about to be finished. And if you go, this is the year when it finishes. He takes his army and there's bloodshed all over. Read the book by Mary Hughes, The Land is Mine. And if you read the book by Mary Hughes, you'll find there's bloodshed all over the place. It was terrible. It was terrible. But when they came to Jerusalem, he stopped. He says, "I I don't want the city destroyed. I don't want it ruined. They encamped outside and they took number 48 bomber squadron with the little bi-wing planes. And he sent them over the, the walls of Jerusalem, flying over the, Turkish bo- the, the, the Turks, and they dropped leaflets and not bombs. They didn't fire one shot. Not one shot was fired, and not one bomb was dropped. And the Turks, they looked, and they saw and beheld these uh, leaflets coming down from these planes. And they just walked out and gave up. They surrendered without a bomb being dropped and a shot being fired. 9th of December, 1917, General Allenby goes, walks in the Jaffa Gate of Jerusalem and declares the Balfour Declaration is in place. Freedom and liberation. And that was for the Palestinians at the time too. Now notice this. He goes in on the 9th of December. Here is an inscription, or scripture, and becomes an inscription. And if I can find it, 31. Isaiah 31, verse 5. Isaiah 31, verse 5. The Lord says, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. <laughs> Sent the planes over like great birds flying, dropping leaflets. And they went out to little, two, a couple, two or three little private soldiers. We Tommies are standing there with their guns and they just dropped everything says, we give up. Just as God had said. He preserved the city. Jesus says that a fig tree would be back again and that fig tree started that, the sprout in 1917 right till 1948. So Jesus says, when you see that, summer's near. There's a sign for you to watch out for, and it's one of the signs of the times of the fig tree again. Matthew 24, verses 6 to 14. We'll, we'll, not, we'll maybe skip across it because time's almost gone already. My, you just, this flies when you go into these subjects. Notice this, Matthew 26, verses 6 to 14. It gives us the declension of morality, the abounding of iniquity, on the escalation of war. It says in verse 7, For nation shall rise 
against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquake in divers places. Jesus now is saying, sitting in the Mount of Olives, this is happening now, he says, but listen, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Is there anywhere on our planet at the moment that there's not trouble, strife, upheaval? Is there anywhere on our planet where there isn't uh, even weather pattern changing? Is there anywhere on our planet where there isn't evil happening? Even when you go into Matthew 24 and you can read it when you go home, Jesus says when he returns, the earth will be like as the days of Noah were. So shall it be when I come back. I'm paraphrasing for time's sake. He says in the days of Noah, there'll be the fig tree. That's one of them. It's going to get worse to the place where when Noah, if you read uh, Genesis chapter 6, there was murder and evil thoughts continually in the hearts and minds of men. And God sent the flood. to Noah to build the ark. Sent the flood. Jesus said when he comes back, the world will be like that. But he's not going to send the flood this time. He's coming back in fire. With fire. Nation shall rise against nation. But it's going to climax. If you will go with me to Ezekiel 38, please. And this is, this is a massive subject. So I'm just going to throw these out here. Little darts for you to think about. Ezekiel 38, please. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So God mentions people here, Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. Gog, Magog, or it means big, giant, colossal, to the north of the land of Israel. And the big, giant, colossal place, the north, right up to the north of the land of Israel, is Russia. Now you notice whenever these, these nations are mentioned here, and tell me, are these not what you hear gathering together as a conglomerate, an axis at this very, very time? The, he says, Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. Then he says, he mentions in Ezekiel 38 and verse 5, who will come in allegiance or an alliance with Gog, Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. Persia. Persia is actually Iran. Persia is Iran. In fact, I would have taken in some of Iraq and a little bit more. It was bigger. But it was a ninth, I, Iran only came into existence as Iran in 1935. So then it was Persia. It says Persia will come. Let's just read on. Ethiopia. And that's not just the country of Ethiopia. That actually uh, then would take up Sudan. Look at the Sudan at the minute. You see the rise of Islam in the Sudan. And then he says Libya. Well, there you are. speaks for itself. With them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer. Now, this one's a hard one. People have said different places, the steps of Russia. Some say it's Germany. You look at the Islam rise in Islam in Germany. I've heard some people say, well, it could be a bit of France. I don't think so, but they're coming with it. And we think of that and the pressing from Germany of the European Union. Notice this. And the house of Tagarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. The house of Tagarma, Turkey, and the Turkish peoples, Turkestan, T Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, all the stand, satellites of Russia, the, the USSR. He says, they'll all come together against the land of Israel. Now, just for time's sake, flick over the verse 13, please. Run, let your eye run down. There is another group who come against them. And if you're looking at this, it's, look, say in 2009, I think it was, I preached, is Syria, the war in Syria, a sign of the end times? I got hammered for it because I said Russia would be in Syria. I got hammered online for it. I mean, the things that were thrown at me. Who's in Syria? Who, Russia? And they're not going to stop in Syria. They're going to keep coming down. Now listen, there's another alliance of peoples come, and this is where the war really takes over. Verse 13, Sheba and Dedan. That's another two that are a bit, no one's 100% sure, but people think. You ready? 
People think that that is maybe Yemen, Saudi Arabia. Now, here's the thing. Saudi Arabia is one of the most vile countries on the planet for wickedness and human rights. How would they come? Here's why. They're not worried. They're not worried about uh, Jerusalem or the land of Israel or any of that. They're, it's the power they're looking for. Now, listen, here's the thing. Just the crown prince of Saudi Arabia this week has, become, has come over to again flush their cash in the billions for Britain to drop bombs on the innocents. And here they are, they are the, probably one of the only allies, even though they are a, a wicked generation people, they, they're the only allies of Britain in the Middle East there. I have no, if you want, I, I have no love for what they're doing. In fact, I don't like what they do, how they treat women. I watched a program on them the other night. You know what it says? They thought oh, this was great. Well, we're going to start letting them drive. You're going, you're very good, aren't you? Yes, you're going to start letting them drive. And this was meant to be a big revelation to the world. This was on a news bulletin. Oh, you see how they're changing? Nonsense. We're going to start letting them drive. But nevertheless, if it's them, if it's them, the, the Scripture also talks in verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarsus with all the young lands thereof. Uh, Tarsus, people believe, is uh, in Spain. Now, there's a place, Tartesius, in Spain. But Tarsus really means smelting. And they used to go smelting to the south of Britain. And they used to smelt for the copper and for the, uh, the iron. And, and they used to actually make brass out of what? And the tin. And they used to make brass in the days of Solomon. The mines are still there today. You can actually see them where they used to let the, 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 the molten metal run down the sides and towards the sea because it was, they used to dig it out with bone. And then they, they learned to make brass instruments out of the metal and the tin in, in England. Notice this. It says here that they, have, they will come, a great merchant or a great naval fleet will come. The great naval fleet with all the young lands. The, the British land will come again. The British land with all the Commonwealth nations. And they say, Art thou come to take a spoil? And he's saying, look for, these, come, look for these people starting to come together. United States of America. Can you see it all now? See when you're watching the news? I want you to see. Listen for Russia. Listen for Iran and Hezbollah in Syria. They're all together right through into Lebanon. It's like a great big arch. And Russia at the top pressing down. Turkey now is becoming more radicalized. Keep your eyes on them. Even the, the Turkmenistan, there, there's actually a program that's been going for years now, and it's called the Shanghai Cooperation. And it's the, it's the Chinese Red Army and the Russian Red Army, but now they've incorporated those stand countries who have armies. And they're actually, they actually do uh, military drills together for years and years and years. And what they did, the Chinese helped do, was right across where Pakistan would be, they actually built what's known as a Karakoram Highway. Hundreds and hundreds of miles from China right the whole way across. Why? That they can just travel right across. They have built a, a massive, China have built a massive base in, in, in Iran, a massive uh, military base. A, a, a naval port actually it is. They've built it. can't remember the name of it now. They have built this. Do you know they've went to South America and they've actually bought up nearly half the countries of South America to take their oil? And they've actually built now big refineries in the southern uh, countries of America out there at the Caribbean Sea. And they're taking over the whole area. This is all the sign of the times. I'm trying to throw all this in one night. I, I might be blowing some minds here. Notice this. In Matthew 24, he says, And then shall be, many shall be offended in verse 10. See this whole message? You know where it came from? I heard another moaner talking about being offended. I'm sick and tired of it, honestly. I don't mean to be cross about it. It's everything offended me. Offended me. Listen. That word was in my mind, and this is where this message comes from, from this line. Then shall many be offended. 
and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. You know what the word offended means? To see in another what I disapprove of and what hinders me from acknowledging their right. What hinders me from acknowledging their right. Someone says, see them Christians telling you you need saved. Oh, they offend me. See those Christians who, who wouldn't bake my cake. They've offended me. They don't want to acknowledge what is right. Jesus said this would happen. In this society of today, it is the offended generation. I'm offended at the word of God. I'm offended at the gospel. I'm offended at the name of Jesus. I'm offended that you don't accept my lifestyle. I'm offended that you believe in righteous judgment. I'm offended you didn't bake my cake, and I'm offended you have a conscience for it. I'm offended that you didn't trust me. I'm offended, I'm offended. So let me put this out there. I'm offended when people take the name of the Lord in vain. I'm offended when he's blasphemed by the world. I'm offended when the name of Jesus is used as a curse word. I'm offended when crass and vulgar language is used in front of me. I'm offended when the word of God is removed and belittled. I'm offended when obscenities are said to me about my Savior. I'm offended when people say he's my imaginary friend or a sky fairy. I'm offended when rock groups call themselves, for example, one calls itself the cradle of filth after our Lord in the manger. I'm offended at that. I'm offended when people try to push you around to talk to you the way they would never talk to anyone else who wasn't a Christian just because you are one. They think they can talk to you the way they want. I'm offended. When I'm, I'm offended I'm not allowed to live by my conscience according to the Word of God. I'm offended that I'm not allowed to have convictions with the Word of God. And I'm offended that when I do live by the Word of God, I'm openly called a bigot. I'm offended. I want to talk about offense. I'm offended, but I won't cut your throat. I'm offended, but I won't chop your head off or your hands off. I'm offended, but I won't be violent to you. I'm offended, but I won't bring you to court in order to throw you into prison. I'm offended, but I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. It doesn't matter why you're offended or not, Christian, the government will do nothing about it anyway. He says, they'll betray one another, give one another up. We see it. They're right and center. They'll hate one another, he says. And we see that. The word hate means to pursue with hatred. Even in the church, people are pursuing each other with hatred. Listen to what, Jesus, what John says in 1 John 3 and 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. There's that word abiding again. The wrath of God abides in those who know not Christ. But yet, eternal life abides in those who do he says, but if you hate, if you pursue your brother, say all oh, manner of malice against him and her, your sister, without any, even with just cause. He says, you're a murderer. You're murdering their character. You're murdering them. He says, now eternal life is not abiding in you. You're not saved, in other words. Matthew 24, verse 11, Jesus says, he'll give me another five minutes more close. Everybody all right for five? Take ten of one. <laughs> Honestly, five minutes, this is the last few lines. I've been had to cut a lot of that out there. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. We have looked at that a little, but notice the word deceive means seduce and lead astray. We looked at that with uh, the, the, the prophet and the false antichrist system. But notice the charismatic renewal has brought many in saying they're Pentecostal. And you know what it is? It's ecumenism to lead them back to the place of the chamber where the smoke arises. Millions, millions died for their faith burned in the fires of Smithfield. Millions died rejecting the mass 
and the stupid Pentecostal charismatics are starting to accept it all again. They're being deceived. The ecumenical movement, and here's the latest one, the NAR is the New Apostolic Reformation. Leading people astray. The World Council of Churches formed in 1948, strangely enough. In Matthew chapter 12, 24 and 12, he says, Iniquity shall abound because the love of many shall wax cold. The word iniquity is anomia, and that's where you get the word antinomianism, where it's, it's all hyper grace, no law. Listen to what the Lord says. Iniquity, no law. Can you imagine if we took the street signs down and the government says hey, there's no speed limits? They'd be flying up and down here and wrecking the place. Can you imagine if there was no laws in school and the kids would be killing each other? And can you imagine if, if they were coming and doing what they wanted and mom was able to just walk into your house and lift, uh, and lift out of your house and maybe shoot you or stab you and just take it all out and say, well, there's no law to stop me. Can you imagine a life like that? Yet Christians think because we're under the grace of God that they can live without the law. Love how to like. Rack and tear. The Lord says, because lawlessness is the word for iniquity, anomia, because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. You know why? Because they love themselves more than they love the Lord. It's all about me, gospel. I am blessed. Oh, I'm going to be rich. I am a little God. All this sort of stuff. I am. Yeah, are you? Well, one day you'll stand before the living God. Jesus says, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose lawlessness is forgiven. In Matthew 24 and 14, he says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all the nations, and then the end shall come. Surely, the gospel of the kingdom. Surely, we're almost there. So this is the final scripture in Zechariah. He's sitting on Mount of Olives saying, this temple is destroyed. Brothers and sisters, I don't mean to offend anyone. Listen, I really don't. But see, if you want to help a Jewish person, don't send them to a temple. Send them to Christ. Send them to Christ. For he's coming back again. Listen to what it says in Zechariah 14 and 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east, toward the west, and there shall be a great valley. The half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and the half toward the south. Notice this in the end of verse 5. It says, And God shall come. And all the saints with thee. Jesus is coming. He'll come to the Mount of Olives. See if you want to do. I know some of us have been quite a few times to see all around Jerusalem. So you want to go again? Go again. Because see when he comes, the place is going to be wrecked. They can build all the temple they want. When Jesus comes, there's going to be an earthquake. Do you know that the Mount of Olives actually sits on a fault line? That runs all the way down to the Horn of Africa. Can you imagine if that just opens up? I'm sure there'll be tidal waves all over the world. The place will be, everywhere will be wrecked. And you know what's happening? The feet that they nailed to the tree is the feet that are going to land on the Mount of Olives. Where he's sitting telling them this will happen, he says, it's okay, guys, I'm coming back to here. I'll see you then. But are you saved? Have you been to the cross? Are you blood washed? Are you right with God? Because only those who will enter his kingdom who are born again of the Spirit and washed in the blood of the Lamb. God bless his word. I know it was long tonight, but...